Today on the Moxie Games. It's the beginning of the end as the semifinals for the Hedis Las Vegas Classic start up with a match off between Beer, Vampir, and Sniper Shorsh. The WJF overall championship heads into its final three events featuring competitors from Japan, Australia, Germany, and the US. The launch of Venom's World Trick Shot Grand Prix kicks off with Tom Rossman squaring off against Stefano Palinga. Team White Dragon faces Team Surreal Killers for the Sepak Tatra Open Championship title. The world premiere of the Moxie Games original event, Dodge, Juggle, and more. I'm Penn Gillette, and you're watching the Moxie Games. This year, the Moxie Games are being held at SkillCon, the ultimate skill convention, which features exhibitions, performances, demonstrations, workshops, and learning experiences from the world's best practitioners in the most diverse set of skills targeting physical and mental abilities. SkillCon is where you can not only see the Moxie Games live, but also learn these skills from the best in the world. We'd like to thank this year's sponsors, Angry Joe's Coffee and Moose Walks for supporting our event. Right now, the Hedis Las Vegas Classic Semifinals are about to get started. And the world's greatest rock, paper, scissors champion, Master Roshambola, is standing by. Thanks, Finn, and a big thank you to Moxie Games for hosting us. The Hedis Las Vegas Classic Semifinals will feature Beer Vampir, pronounced vampire in English, but only rhymes in German, so we'll stick to German. Sniper Schorsch, Petty Potter, and Rolly the Butcher. These are not the athletes' legal names, however, these are the names they are best known for in the sport of Pettis. Right now, we're getting started with the first semi-final matchup between Beer, Vampir, and Sniper Schorsch. There are only a few rules you need to be aware of. We are playing to 11 points, but you have to win by two, and we're playing best two out of three sets to win the match. The serve must bounce on the server's side first. And if it hits the net or the opponent's side of the table first, the point goes to the opponent. Now joining us for expert play-by-play -play commentary. All the way from Germany is Thomas Mika and Felix Nauert. Okay, thank you Master Roschenbola and good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. I'm Thomas Mika. And I'm Felix Nauert. Let's get right to the action. <laughs> so a slow start from both players. No risk at the beginning. Oh, he hit it right into the camera. Nice start. Oh, he's too short for this ball. Got a decent volley going here. Both competitors taking it easy on each other. Oh, net shot and the ball comes back. Oh, that one just almost made it above the net. Oh, what a spin. Do you see it? Nice spin move there by the Beer Vampire, and he's, yo, oh, I, th I think the Beer Vampire actually managed to outsmart himself that time. Uh, back to Transylvania, buddy. Oh, and a great Murach. That's a mistake at the serve. He's really good at this. Seeing the replay again, nice Murach by Beer Vampire. Going back to the action now, nice corner shot off the end of the table. Oh! Clearly point for Sniper. Using your hand there, buddy. That's not allowed, and the Beer Vampire gets back to work. What's going on with Vampire? 6-1 already, Sniper at the serve, smash left, right, next mistake by Beer Vampire, 7-1 already. Mistakes, mistakes, mistakes. Nice volley to start, both players taking a little bit more of a conservative approach at this time. And the Beer Vampire come back, first volley, next volley, oh that's too short for the Sniper, 7-2. Little shin to the table action there, you gotta watch out for injuries in an event like this. And again with the spin move from the Beer Vampire. He's getting a lot of spin on that. But Sniper's good at volley too, but it's not enough for the defense of Vampire. Sniper Snort showing what he's made of with a nice power move across the table. Another spin move to start. Some of these hits are a little dirty, hitting the net. That is legal, but both competitors want to maintain control at this point. Point for Vampire, in German we say it, 
beide gut. Really great point by both players. Defensive action, offensive action. Really, really nice head is. But there you see, snipers slow. 7-5 already. Vampire back in the game. Mistake. Another mistake. Two easy points for Sniper. Oh, nervous mistake by Beer Vampire here at set points for Sniper. Falk serves. Nice high move, giving Marcus plenty of time for that volley. It was up in the air. He had all day long to make that actual hit. Easy mistakes by both players. Not a good serve, but not a good smash from the Sniper. So it's 9 7. Next easy mistake, 10-7 for the Sniper. So here we got the set points for Sniper. And Falk continues to send them off the table. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if this is part of a long-term ploy on his part or whether the beer vampire had too much beer last night. Sniper's chance to win the set while he's serving. He forces beer vampire down to the ground and wins the set. Here once again we see Sniper dominates the game. And you can see the love each competitor has, not only for the sport, but looking out for each other in a match like this. It's a wonderful thing to see. They've not just got to face each other, they have to last through this match and then go on to the finals. So you can imagine most of these competitors taking a more conservative approach. Beer Vampire licking his chops right now. Falk takes a dive, hits the floor, gets right back up, and a nice hand slap between one player to another. So Sniper Shorts wins game one against Beer Vampire. This is a best of three, so Vampire still has a chance to advance to the finals. Game two coming up soon. I'll be back later on for the Rock, Paper, Scissors Las Vegas Pro-Am Grand Prix. But right now, the World Juggling Federation's advanced competitions are about to get started on the expo stage. So I will leave you for now in the capable hands of Las Vegas juggler extraordinaire, Jeff Savillico. Thanks, Master Rosh. We are just moments away from the final three competitions of the Advanced Overall Championship. You can see our competitors warming up here, about to take on the Advanced Short programs, first with five balls, then five rings, then five clubs. Yesterday, the competitors started the Advanced Overall Championship with the Endurance and Freestyle competitions. This is an accumulative score from two days of events, and these first competitions awarded one point for first place, 0.5 points for second place, and 0.25 points for third place. Starting with the endurance competitions, all competitors failed to qualify nine balls, so it was an even score on that. In the eight ring endurance competition, Spencer Androli secured second place with the bare minimum 16 catches, and Delaney Bayless received first place with just two more catches, finishing with 18. The seven club endurance competition had strong placements, starting off with Delaney Bayless in third place with 18 catches. Spencer Androli in second place with 24 catches. And Masahiro Takahashi in first place with 54 catches. And you can see here, after the endurance competitions concluded, Delaney was in first place as a result of two second place finishes and one third place finish. Spencer and Masahiro tied for second place with one point each. In the five ball freestyle competition, Julius Prue received third place for two connected five up 360s. Spencer Androli received second place for a 97531 up the back into back boxes. And first place goes to Delaney Bayless for a back cross 360 into overhead throws. Delaney received second place in the seven ball freestyle competition with a five up 540 into a collect. And Julius Poole received first place for a five up 360 into 8x6. And in the final freestyle competition, third place went to Masahiro Takahashi for a run of body throws. Second place, Kenny Chung for a run of a move called Lazies. 
and Delaney takes home another first place finish with a 3-up 360 into 7-5-6-6-1. So final scores after the endurance and freestyle competitions. We have Delaney in the lead with a 3.75, Spencer trailing behind in second by 2.25 points with a 1.5, Julius in third with a 1.25, and Kenny with a 3.25 point disadvantage going into the short program with only a half a point. And what more appropriate background imagery could we ask for than the Moxie Games dancers kicking off the final three events in the overall championship? Today you're going to see Delaney Bayless, Kenny Chung, and Spencer Androli's five ball routines. And now, here to provide you with expert play-by-play -play commentary is World Juggling Federation President Jason Garfield and Penn Gillette. Thanks, Jeff, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am joined by Penn Gillette, who started his career in entertainment as a juggler, and being one of the smarter ones, realized that it was going to take more than juggling to get where he is today, and yet it's because of juggling that he is literally here today. Anyway, welcome back, sir. Good to see you, Jason. Thank good you. Thanks you, for being Thanks here. For so, you know, you joined the ranks of many celebrities who started their careers off as jugglers. Um, Neil Patrick Harris, Patrick Dempsey, Steve Martin, and Tom Hanks. Um, all of these success stories have one thing in common, which is that they quit juggling and then success followed. Mm -hmm. Now, surely it takes more uh, than just quitting juggling to become successful, but is it that in order to become successful, you must stop juggling? Uh, it sure seems that way. You know, uh, one of the exceptions is, you know, Bob Dylan started juggling later in his career. He does a three ball cascade now, he does. So uh, he got successful and then juggle, which is another way to do it. Or you can stop juggling and then get successful. Either way works, I think. But learning how to juggle after you're successful will not take the success away. Doesn't seem to. Uh, but probably best of all is to never start. Don't do it at all. Yeah. And speaking of which, next up in the five ball short program is Delaney Bayless. Delaney entered this competition last year for the first time at age 17 and placed second. Jonah Botvin at Greenhouse placed first, but he's not here this year to defend his title, which leads to potential vacancy of all of for Delaney. That is an incredibly difficult connection going from a 5-up 360 right into back crosses. It's so difficult and now Delaney has to decide if she's going to try it again or move on. And she's moving on to a 3-up 720 and nails that. You know, you can waste time and lose more points if you continue to fail. Going from overhead throws right into back crosses, that's a good connection. Yeah, that looks hard. And a 3-up back cross 360 out of it. But she won't get the connection bonus for that 360, but she will maintain the points for the overhead to back cross connection. Now, st stopping between tricks gives you no connection, right? Right. But it's, it's, you still get your points for the trick. Yeah, if you qualify the move, you still get the points for it, but if you were planning a connection and your start value is based on that connection, then you're going to bring your score down a little bit. I see. Sure. There's a one high, four low, five up 360. The first throw higher than the rest so that it comes down last. That's a nice angle to see back crosses from. That's yeah. a three up back cross 360. There's those overhead throws, and that, that's that connection right into back crosses. Yeah, it's pretty. And that's the most difficult version of it. It's not as difficult to go from back crosses to overheads, but from overheads, because you're going lower, it makes it more difficult to get into back crosses. And there's that one high, four low, five up 360. That is really nice. And Delaney scores a 5.96 for her five ball short program, bringing her overall score up to a 9.71. Kenny Chong and Spencer Androli still have a chance to get their scores up from the five ball routines, and we'll see that soon. But coming up next, Denim's World Trick Shot Grand Prix, the Rock Paper Scissors Pro Am Grand Prix, the Sepak Takra Open, and Dog Juggle only on the Moxie Games. While we wait for the debut of Venom's World Trick Shot Grand Prix to begin, let's check out some of the foot sports at the Moxie Games. This year, Foot Sports UK launched a completely new sport, foot darts. It was an overnight success, gaining 57 million views and an invitation to SkillCon, where they held an eight-day tournament and, in collaboration with SkillCon, created an even newer event. Takra Darts. The idea? Recruit Sipa Takra's finest players to serve and spike balls into the huge 22 foot by 25 foot dartboard. This year was just an exhibition to pave the way for next year's World Takra Dart Championships. This is a new and exciting foot and dart sport event that's going to continue to explode all over the world. Of course, we also have the best dart dart players at SkillCon. That's 10 bullseyes and zero. But we'll get to them later. 
For now, back to Venom's World Trick Shot Grand Prix, where Brian Pauley and Jason Lynch are standing by. And thank you, Penn Gillette, for the intro, and welcome everyone to Venom's World Trick Shot Grand Prix. I'm Jason, the Michigan Kid Lynch, and joining me here in the booth is Brian Superman Pauley, an artistic pool player in his own right. How you doing, Jason? I'm doing well. We got four great competitors today, and it's going to be some great trick shots to watch. And today starts the beginning of a new pool trick shot tournament created by one of the world's most recognizable figures in the sport. People always think, you know, I have the best job on the planet, but they really, they, they don't see the sacrifices behind it, you know, it's um, a lot of traveling, it's a lot of practice, and, you know, you have a family, you can't spend so much time with them, you know, you're, you're literally missing your own bed because you sleep, you know, half the time in a hotel and spend your life in travel in planes and cars, and uh, it's, it's a tough life. You know, I've been playing so many years and you, know, you can see a little bit what the problem, why it's not working, why is it working and you know, I felt like doing my own event was just a normal pass, you know, it was just something I wanted to do and I had this incredible opportunity to work with Skillcon and you know, I just, I just grabbed it and I figured you know, we'll try something and uh, no, really the whole, the whole thing was, was incredible. Coming to you live from Las Vegas, Nevada for the World Trick Shot Grand Prix. He's a 2012 inductee for the National Italian American Sports Hall of Fame, a three-time ESPN World Cup of Trick Shots champion, a two-time ESPN Trick Shot Magic champion. Say hello to Mr. Trick Shots, Stefano Palinga. Our second competitor. He is a three-time ESPN World Cup of Trick Shots champion. He's a 2007 U.S. Open Artistic Pool champion. The 2006 WPA Open Artistic Pool champion. He is considered the founding father of modern-day artistic pool. Say hello to Dr. Q, Tom Rossman. All right, well, Tom's chosen for the first shot here. This is a compression bank shot, a kick shot, actually. He's going to hit the cue ball into the rail. It's going to pass by the nine there and kick the eight ball cross side, flipping the bag over, sending that eight ball into the side pocket. All right, Tom, let's see if he does this here. How would he hit that? No problem, man. He does this in the shows all the time. I expect him to make this one. Beautiful shot. Here's Stefano. No score there. Oh, wow, he just missed the bag. Yeah, so Tom took a one-point lead here. Stefano has uh, picked one of Mike Massey's shots, actually out of Mike Massey's book. This is called a jizz and hum mess. You've got to get all these balls set perfectly on this table. The kisses, caroms, everything's got to work together. Yeah, Massey uh, named it properly. It does look like a mess right there. All right, very difficult here. Let's see what he does. Wow, oh, no problem. Oh, he hit that like a hanger, didn't he? Yeah, Stefano tied it up, one apiece. Nice shot, Stefano. A little replay here. Good to see him back shooting. There's Tom, see if we can answer. A little slower. Yeah. There's a good Pocket there. speed. Look at this. Not a problem. Tom, leading two to one here. That's yeah. a beautiful shot. Everything pocket speed here. Even makes the cue ball. The third shot, and Tom's second shot, it's a push-through th shot. It's actually called a hand is quicker than the eye. He's got a big distance between the cue ball and the three. He's going to hit the cue ball and follow through. The cue and the five will actually split, actually hit the three ball into two balls that are hidden under the handkerchief. The biggest thing on this is to actually have a, a really good straight follow-through to make this shot. We'll see uh, whose eye is quicker on this one. Looks like he's got a magic trick here. It's pretty shot if he hits it. No problem. Look at that. Great shot. Three to one. Favor of Tom. Put some pressure on Stefano here. He answered back. I almost had to carry him with the two ball there. Three to two in favor of Tom. Very nice stroke there by Stefano. 
All right, Stefano's second shot, the fourth shot in this match. It's a jump mass A shot. He's going to elevate his cue stick, hit the one ball into the corner pocket, jump over that row of balls, and come around three rails. Stefano's really known for his stroke shots, so we'll see what happens here. It'll be interesting what Tom does with this, because Tom's more of the entertainer setup shots. We'll see how he does with this. He needs to make this a tight up. Oh, man. Oh, he clipped the roll of balls. There. Didn't expect that. Yeah, he just, cl he just didn't seem like he got enough of a jump on it. There's Tom answering. Oh, good stroke. Here we go. Check this out. Three rails. Does he get it? Does he get it? Oh, man. Did not connect. Still in the lead, three to two here. Boy, put a nice stroke on that. Yeah. Very nice stroke. Look at the spin on that ball. Pretty shot, but he barely misses. Misses by only inches. Look at that. Unbelievable. Wow. This comes up in a lot of the trick shots that we do. He's going to actually hit this ball, take it off the other cushion, catch it in the cup. Now, the biggest thing here is getting the right speed and angle on the cue to allow that ball to jump back at you and not off the table. This is why you try this at your neighbor's house. You don't want to mess up your own pool room. Time in the driver's seat, three to two, so he's picking an old standard of his. Oh, look at this. Yeah, nothing but net. That's smart for Tom to do that, because he knows the shot in and out. See Stefano's response. Look at this. Pretty good hands for Stefano there. Tom's still leading four to three here. Here's the replay. He hit this really good. Pretty quick there with a the hand. All right, this is actually a shot that Stefano's uh, used in ESPN Trick Shot Magic numerous times. The biggest thing here is to actually just hit the seven on the jump. You do not want to hit the nine when you jump that cue ball into those stacked balls because if you do hit the nine, there's no chance of it coming down and landing on the ball. Stefano's really known for this. I've seen him shoot this many, many times, and I expect him to hit this again. Oh, man, he almost made that. Boy, I'm surprised he missed that. I've seen him make that so many times. Yeah, it's just a, such a tough shot. You see the cue ball came up and clipped the nine. That's why uh, it actually didn't fall straight down. Oh, man, Tom didn't miss it, too. I've Same seen thing there. See, Tom's actually hitting the bottom of the seven. So it actually popped the nine ball at an angle. That's why it didn't drop down on the on the bottle there. And here's another one of our prop shots. When you follow through and hit that eight ball, you do not want to have that cue ball land on your cue stick. You've got to have some quick hands to get this to move, and that and you've got to bank the ball cross side. Yes, Tom uses this a lot in his shows, and uh, I expect him to make this first time. Tom's still in the driver's seat here. Oh, man. Short. The table's playing a little shorter than you know, the both players are used to, I think. And it came about a half a diamond short there. Just missed it. Now let's see if Stefano actually looks at that and makes an adjustment. He actually did make an adjustment. Oh, wow, he over-adjusted. He over-adjusted. Yeah, that's what happens there. Yeah, he went a little slower than Tom, but yeah, he over-adjusted. All right, Stefano's pick for the eighth shot in the match. A really quirky shot. He's actually got two cigarettes stood up there, and the way to actually not foul through on these is actually to hit your hand on the end of the table as you stroke through, and that limits the distance that cue can travel forward. Very difficult shot, a really quirky shot. Yeah, this is another one Stefano's known for, and uh, many of us have tried this, have uh, busted our knuckles up on the table pretty good trying this. Yeah, you can't hit those cigarettes. Actually... Oh, no problem. See, the trick on this is actually he hits his hand on the back of that table. That stops him from going too far forward. I don't know how many of us has hurt our hand trying that shot. This shot's been around for a while. Tom might have this in his uh, in his bag of tricks. We'll see. No way. Oh, man, just scooped it. Right yeah, he's just a little blow center hop the cue ball. Smart shot by Stefano tying the game up here at 4-all. All right, Tom's chosen the just showing off shot with a little added addition with the jump here. This shot was actually made famous by Steve Mizrak in a beer commercial. <laughs> Steve was a elementary school teacher. He used to use pool and geometry to teach his students. Yeah, this is always a real, real fun shot. There's cute. There's balls going all over the place here. When now you're jumping a ball off the rail, you got to time this just right. Yeah, the biggest thing on this is to readjust after you hit the first cue ball. You have to readjust and hit that jump shot in time. 
Probably the most popular trick shot of all time. There's the eight Look ball. At this. Yeah. No problem. Not that good. Beautiful yeah. shot. Nice variation of that old classic shot. Mm -hmm. now, I think Stefano should make this without any problem. The biggest thing for Stefano, he's he's the strong point's not the speed jumps and stuff like that. So he has to reposition himself quick enough to be able to hit this jump before that nine ball falls. Let's see what he does. Here the balls go. Does he get in time? Yes, he does. Ooh, okay. Buzzer beater there. But he did get the ten ball in the corner before that nine drop. Nice shot. Hold on. Hold on a second. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> nice show, Sportsman, by Dr. Q there. That was beautiful. That was a beautiful stroke. Here's the replay here. Three positions. There's the jump. Catch. Barely got it in there before the nine, but he did get it there. So as it stands right now, both players are tied with five points each. This is a first to ten point scoring system, so it's still anyone's game. But right now you can hear the Moxie Games music starting from the expo stage, which means it's time for the Rock, Paper, Scissors, Las Vegas Pro-Am Grand Prix to get started. So we'll take you now to that, and we'll see you back here later for the continuation of Venom's World Trick Shot Grand Prix. Ladies and gentlemen, the Moxie Games Dancers. And now, please welcome your host, the undisputed greatest rock, paper, scissors player of all time, Master Rochambola. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. And a big hand for uh, Moxie Games, well, for the Moxie Games dancers. Uh, you guys are about to see unparalleled one-on-one -on -one hand sports combat. Uh, anyone who doesn't believe rock, paper, scissors is a serious sport has never actually played it. It requires the same mental focus and reaction time as gymnastics, esport fighting games, and horseshoes. Now, there are two basic strategies in rock, paper, scissors. Reading the other player, then influencing what they do. There's two ways to do this. Uh, both physical, you can look at what the other person is throwing, physical tells, or you can influence them with the way you throw. You can also pick up on patterns, as well as put out fake patterns to fool your opponent. There's also cheating. Switching throws last minute. Now this is very low play, only used by very sad and desperate players. Uh, Refing today's match is someone who's called me out on those things more times than I remember. He has busted me over and over again for attempting to cheat, and he has actually made me a better player. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you the head referee of the World Rock, Paper, Scissors Society, direct from Toronto, Canada, Brad Fox. Thank you very much. We've seen a very high level of play today. Um, for those of you who are just joining us and not aware of the rules of competitive rock, paper, scissors, I'll give a brief overview. There are three throws. There are only three throws. They are rock, paper, scissors. Paper is always horizontal. Scissors is always vertical. This is a competitive match, so we're playing under WRPS International Rules, which is a three-prime shoot. That's one, two, three, and then you deliver your throw on the fourth prime. These eight competitors qualified through their skills in playing something called street. They managed to hustle enough bucks out of their fellow competitors to make the top eight. But now we're in the finals, we're playing a structured competitive game, full hustler rules. The first competitor to 10 points wins. This is a direct elimination tournament, so the winner moves on, and the loser goes home. It is going off to an early win. Two zero at this point. And we're seeing a lot of ties. These competitors are obviously trying to wear each other out. We're looking at a hard fought defensive battle here. It's 3 0. 1 3. 4. Hold up, hold, hold, hold. Your papers are starting to get a little bit horizontal. Brad Fox getting in there, making sure the competitors are actually delivering legal throws. Count is still 1 to 4. Douglas, time to wake up, man. 2-4, 2-5, 2-6, 2-7, 2-8, 2-9, 2-10, 2-11, 2-12, 2-13, 2-14, 2-15, 2-16, 2-17, 2-18, 2-19, 2-20, 2-21, 2-22, 2-23, 
All right, and uh, what's your name, please? Uh, Heather. Heather, you also known as? Uh, the Dominator. Okay, and uh, what's your name? Bennett. Uh, do you have a uh, nickname in the sport? Bennett. All right, <laughs> that's awesome. Go with what you know. I love it. All right, Dominator versus Bennett. On my mark, ready? Bennett standing left foot forward. Scissors tie. Lock up for scissors. 1-0. 1-1. At that point, we're up 2-1. 2-1. Bennett takes the lead. Take it off. A little bit slower. Okay, ready? Right. On my mark, ready? Go. Tie. 1-3. Three. 2-3. Three. Threes. 4-3. 5-3. Advantage Dominator. Heather starting off from behind. That's a defensive strategy. We call the Urbanus opening. Ready? Five four. Six four. Six five. That's fine. It was her point anyways. Ready? High matches again. Sixes. Six seven. Bennett takes the lead. Sevens again. These competitors are completely in each other's head. Completely in each other's head right now. Hey, hey, let them think. Let them think. Bennett's still in it. Dominator's still trying to dominate. 7 8, Bennett. Pins. And Bennett is still in it. Wonderful match, Heather. You really took him the distance on that. Now, an interesting statistic in this match to note. Heather and Bennett tied six times, and each time they both threw scissors. They're obviously both relying on endurance here by tying on the most difficult throw to form, which is scissors. Bennett dominated the Dominator, winning his last three throws in a row. Rock to scissors, paper to rock, and finally destroying the Dominator scissors with his rock. If you smell la 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 what the rock is cooking. Bennett advances to the quarterfinals, and we are halfway through the top eight. Now, let's get Shane and Shu out here for our next match. Paper tie to open. Scissor tie, second throw. And a sloppy rock for third. So it's all tied. Ready? Go. Four ties in a row. Five ties in a row. Unbelievable. Are these competitors going to have anything left in the tank for the later matches? Six ties. Finally, finally, Shane comes up. 1 0. And more ties. 2 0. Good call, Fox. Another tie. 2-1. Shu finally gets on the board. 3-1. Advantage Shane. 3-2. Shu trying to tie it up. Another tie. 4-2. 4-2. Advantage Shane. They love that paper tie after the break. 5-2, five, 5-3. Five, oh, they're working on the railroad there. Keep it in sync, gentlemen. There's the match. Shane wins and advances to the next round. Another interesting statistic to note, Shane and Shu tied a total of 13 times. Nine ties, all his paper. And Shu liked paper so much that it sealed his fate as it met head to head with Shane's scissors. Shane's last six throws followed the pattern rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors. Literally throwing the name of the sport back to back. So Shane advances to the quarterfinals with Jorge and Bennett. One final matchup in the top eight, Grant and JJ, you're up. Ready? Throw. One. Both competitors displaying excellent form, leaving Brad Fox little to do but focus on the count. Uh, the score is three to Score is currently three to one. Advantage JJ, who is actually calling the cadence. Ready? Yep. Throw. Six, 
six two. Seven two. Seven three. Eight three. Eight four. Current eight four. Advantage eight. Eight four. Eight five. Nine five. Match point. Nine six. And JJ, match point. A total of 13 ties, 9 is paper. Paper is the most frequently tied throw in the top 8. This is definitely an endurance match. It reminds me of Ali versus Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle. Now early in the round, I noticed that JJ was controlling the cadence of the match, controlling the pace. Now this has a strategic advantage because different players do train at different speeds. And if you can get the other player to play at your speed, you can control their flow. And in the end, at 9-6, it was paper to paper, paper to paper, and then finally rock to scissors, suck that scissors right out of him with all those paper throws, which advances JJ to the quarterfinals. So just like that, eight competitors are reduced to four. And we'll see Jorge versus JJ and Shane versus Bennett later on in the semifinals. Coming up next in the boxing game, the Sepok Takra finals get started between teams White Dragon and Surreal Kings and Dodge Jungle. SkillCon and the Moxie Games are the home for a variety of athletes who envisioned a new sport or a new direction for their skills. Acro Integration combines martial arts tricking, gymnastics, breaking, and feats of balance and flexibility all into one event. Jamie Stroud, Scott McDonald, and the acrobolic Juji Mufu kicked off their event with an exhibition of their collective skills to set the stage for their competition. More on that coming up soon. Right now, let's join the Sepok Takra Open Final Match between teams White Dragon and Surreal Killers, hosted by ISTAF Australian team representatives Alex Newman and Daniel Ellen Barwell. Thank you, Penn, and welcome to the Moxie Games. We're about to witness some awesome Sepak Takra. We're in Las Vegas, and you're about to witness the first collaboration between the non-profit sporting organization, the Sepak Takra of USA Incorporated, the International Sepak Takra Federation, and their equipment partner, Marathon. They have brought us world-class courts, eight of the top USA teams, and we're about to see an elimination final match between the teams that fought through yesterday to get to here today. My name is Daniel Ellen Barwell, and alongside me, fellow Australian, Alex Newman. Alex, we saw great competition yesterday. This is the final though, this is where it counts. What can you tell us about our two final teams? Thank you, Daniel. Yes, it was a big day of Sebak Takra indeed yesterday, a couple of huge semi-finals. The gold medal match will be played between the Surreal Killers from California, seeded third. They did well to make it through the semi-final, defeating the second seeded team of Minnesota B. And uh, they'll be playing against the Minnesota White Dragon top seed team. Starting on the court will be brothers Kirchar and Truchar. And feeder will be John Lee. On the bench, Gao Sheng, uncle of True and Kerr. So a real family affair there for the Minnesota side. And the Surreal Killers will be represented by Moore Law, Jack Harris, Jim Tao, and starting on the bench will be Jeremy Merkin. If you're not too familiar with Sepak Takra, it's best thought of as a kick volleyball played on a badminton court. That's right, Daniel. Essentially kick volleyball, so three touches a side, is played on a court of the same dimensions as badminton. One of the key differences being that one player can take three consecutive touches if they wish. And of course, the obvious one is that you can use any part of the body to contact the ball except for the hands or the arms. Well, let's go down courtside and we're about to see in the black the White Dragons of Minnesota receiving serve from the Surreal Killers, number two, right. Mua Law. Ah, first serve nerves have the ball going just long. Yeah, shaky start for Moore Law. You can see he didn't quite get on top of that ball. Perhaps an issue with the ball toss from Jim Tao. Second one's much the same. We are under bright lights. It is a high stress situation. And gold medal match. A lot of nerves, I'm sure, for Moore Law and Jim Tao with the ball toss. Trailing 0 to 2. Third time's a charm. We're in. Anthony goes up for the spike. It's a good one. Jack Harris can't quite keep that one under control. And it's a really confident start for the Minnesota White Dragons, leading 3-0 now. Change of serve every three points. Minnesota. Ace right into the pocket. 
and that is brilliant placement. Look at that, right in the gap between Jack Harris and Moore Law, right inside the baseline. Doesn't get much better than that. Second serve, just as good. Moore Law can't control that. Dragons now leading five to zero, and the killer's looking a little bit respondent now. Popped back over, another opportunity for the Minnesota Dragons. Good spike, looks like it's gone wide though. True char, he likes it, but I think it's gone wide. Yep, there you go, slow motion replay shows it's just gone wide. Killer's on the board now. Easy play here for True char. Tries to do a little bit too much though, takes all three and just pops it out of play. And that would be the first real positive signs we've seen from the Surreal Killers. The Moore Law has taken a couple of minutes to get started. That serve was much better though. He's pushed that one right out to the sideline. See what he can do here with this one. Another good serve there. True goes up. Oh, kept in play by Jack Harris. Can't quite get to it though. That ball was in play. You can play the ball as far wide as you want. It's uh, Jack Harris. He's done really well just to get that ball up. Cameraman nearly copped the Takra ball or a foot to the head. It's all part of the price when you pay when you're watching Sebak Takra in close quarters. Big roll spike. First one we have seen so far. And that was Jim. Yeah, Jim Tao on the board. That is a textbook roll spike. The set perfectly positioned right near the net over his left shoulder. Jim Tao executes that fantastic back flipping roll spike motion. Minnesota, another opportunity, quick. It's the sun back, but there's a block thrown up by Jim Tao again. Jim Tao, he's loving that. Look at this block, beautifully positioned. He loves it. He knows it's good as soon as it comes off the shin. Fantastic Sebax Acryl there. That's what you like to see. Kirchar once more. He really has been serving very well at the start of this match. Well, Kirchar, he's perhaps one of the best servers that the United States has ever seen. He's played for the national team before. At huge international events, and he's showing us how he's um, done so well. Mua Law, though, good drop serve there. Kirchar's going for all pace. Mua Law showing us that the deft touch, the short serves, can be just as effective if executed well. There you go, textbook example, Alex. And it was a complete walk away at the start for the Dragons, but now they pulled it back to seven all. That's a good serve from Mua. He's really gotten his act together here. That's another good one. Jack Harris a little bit unlucky to pick that one up. He tried to get off the spike, but the ball's just moving too quick. Eight wide and the Dragons to serve. That's a good one. Jack's under control though. Popped back over. Oh, lots of power, but that is long. Well, the set was nice and high. True Char had all the time in the world to go up and get it, but he's just mistimed that a little. And you can see he's put that well wide. So, 8 all. Kerr showing he's got a drop shot up his sleeve as well. That is a fantastic drop serve. It had very little flight time, so it wasn't as short as Moore Law serves, but uh, it was spent so little time in the air. It's just so effective, and he's backed it up there with a power serve. So. You can see Jack Harris, he was moving forward, he was expecting and anticipating the drop serve. Kirchhoff is keeping him guessing. Chance now for the Surreal Killers from California. Big roll spike, kept in play. Oh, so close. Couldn't convert, true char. He's done so well to block that ball. Here's the block, kept in play. That counts as one touch. Now Gao Chang, that's the second touch, the nice set, the feed. True char, oh. He's gone for the drop spike, it was so close, almost made it over, just couldn't convert in the end. Dragons still have a slender lead though, that's blocked wide by Jim Tao. you got to think it is close, we thought it would be a little bit different, we thought the, the Minnesota team would be walking away when the first few points were played. In Minnesota, they are top seeds coming into this gold medal match. And that's why True Char, another fantastic spike. These three, they've played together so much. They're so well drilled. They're just a well oiled machine. Just look at that technique. Fantastic sunback spike motion. It's almost like a scissor kick. You might see it in soccer or football sometimes, but it's 
the regular occurrence here in the setback tackle world. No! Jim Cow just mistiming that axe kick, the slap of the ball there. Doesn't convert. The Dragons now walking away a little, 13 to 9. Pops back over. Free chance. Oh, clever play. It doesn't always have to be the acrobatic spikes and setback tackle. The simple players can often work just as well. Three quick headers in succession, and it's the placement there that's done the damage for Trucha and the Minnesota White Dragons. So 14-9 is the current score with the Minnesota White Dragons in the lead. We'll take a short break now and hand it back over to Pendulet, who is joined by Adam Candy, who is standing by to present the world premiere of Dodge Juggle, a Moxie game original event. Thank you, Daniel and Alex. We're getting ready for the premiere of Dodge Juggle in just a moment. This has never been done before, so you're witnessing history in the making. This is the sport of the future. I'm sure people have thrown things at jugglers before, but this is the first time that points are being awarded for it. We have John Wee and Owen Morse of the Passing Zone Courtside to introduce today's Dodge Juggle event. And I'm joined by Adam Candy, who will add that professional sports commentator voice to give Dodge Juggle credibility as a legitimate sport. Thanks, Penn. Happy to help. Let's go down to the court side where the passing zone is standing by. Thanks, Penn, and welcome to Dodge Juggle, a Moxie Games original event being held at SkillCon in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm John Wee. And I'm Owen Morse. We are known as the Passing Zone. And tonight we present you Dodge Juggle, a cross between juggling and dodgeball. The big difference is that instead of taking out people, you're taking out jugglers. Yeah, well, you're taking out the jugglers' clubs, at least. Oh, right, yeah. Jugglers are seldom taken out. I, I guess by, that's By right. anyone, really. No, exactly. Uh, yeah. No. We have three gameplay formats tonight, and we're going to start with one on five. That's right. One dodgeballer versus five jugglers. The dodgeballer has to take out as many jugglers as possible within one minute, and the jugglers just have to survive the wave of attacks with their juggling pattern intact. Oh, yeah. It's, it's everyone's dream. First up is the acrobolic Juji Mufu, demonstrating his acrobatic prowess in an apparent attempt to intimidate the five jugglers he's up against. He will have one minute to take them all out, and to do that, he only needs to cause each juggler to drop a minimum of one club each. Unforced errors count, as well as intimidation techniques that result in a drop club. If the competitor succeeds in taking out all five jugglers within his one minute time limit, his completion time will be matched up against the other competitor's time to determine first through third placements and international seating for next year's event. Here are the anthropomorphized juggling wagamoles he's facing. Noah Schmeisner, the number two seated combat juggler in the world. Josh Horton, the number one seated combat juggler in the world. Spencer Androli, an accomplished World Juggling Federation advanced competitor. Max Poff and David Janssen, both combat juggler competitors. Janssen traveled all the way from Sweden to be a dodge juggle whack-a-mole. Alternates are Liam Halstead, Bennett Santora, and Malika Abramson. All right, the countdown has begun, and with the first throw, a direct hit on Liam Halstead, but ineffective. Another attempt this time with a direct hit and exploding a club out the side door. Mr. Mufu targets the face of Malika, misses, but all three clubs fall to the ground. We're now down to three. An unforced error takes Bennett down. Another unforced error brings it down to one. One, Just one more to go here for Juju Mufu. Oh, here he goes. Oh, a direct hit to the gut followed by another attack. And Androli can't maintain control and lets a club drop to the ground. Juju Mufu establishes a time of 28 seconds. He took down his first juggler seven seconds in, then another at 10 seconds in. Juggler 3 fell at 17 seconds due to an unforced error, as did Juggler 4 at 25 seconds. And in the final takedown, a blow right to the very core of Spencer Androli, and he is unable to continue. I only hope you can find someone good enough to stand up against my onslaught! <laughs> he does have an incredible onslaught. He does, I, yeah, I, I noticed that. All right, well, up next is Angry Joe, who's all jacked up on his own amino acid-infused brand of coffee. I drink a lot of Angry Joe coffee. That's what I recommend. Amino acid-infused, yeah. extra caffeine, yeah. I'm angry. 
Okay, well, let's see if extra caffeinated amino acid infused anger is the secret recipe to a Dodge Juggle victory. The countdown begins, and Angry Joe targets Spencer Androli's head, but quick dodge keeps Androli in. Josh Horton drops due to an unforced error, down to four. Bullseye on Max Paul, who's more resilient than David Johnson. Well, he lost a club, so he's on his way out as well. Schmeisner dodging well. Takes, it, takes a couple hits, still does okay. Oh, good, Spencer's out. He didn't get hit, did he? Well, sometimes those unforced errors can be the death of you in a hurry. Androli, although he is out, is pinned in by Angry Joe's repeated peripheral targeting. Oh, Max Poff took that one straight in the chest. One to go now, past the halfway point with less than 30 seconds to go. Striking Schmeisner in the left shoulder and he keeps the clubs in the air. Still in? Just no, hanging in there. Angry Joe's gonna have to go recover and find the balls again. Looks like he's not moving at an angry speed right now. He's angrier, Joe. And Angry Joe is gonna leave one on the floor. As impressive as Juju Mufu was at taking down the five jugglers in record time, Schmeiser sets the world record as the first juggler to survive a one-minute wave of attacks and proves to be the most formidable player in one-on-five dodge juggle. Okay, here we see Angry Joe's first two throws to connect. The first one bouncing off Max Pop without effect, but then striking David Johnson, appearing to temporarily break his arm just long enough to drop a club. What are your hopes for the future of the sport of dodge juggle? Well, I'm hoping that all my little Joes and Josettes out there drink a lot of Angry Joe coffee. I think that'll help. Yeah, yeah. Up next is Charles Peterson of Red Eye Rhino, the leader in sublimated dark jerseys and shirts, and the organizer of America's premier dart event, the Premier Cup of Darts. Oh, David Johnson dodging well there on that first shot. I don't think you want to be the guy in the middle. A near hit aimed at Johnson's head, followed by an attack on Horton. A couple of unforced errors takes Bennett and Maleka out of the round. Going to force Charles to go after Janssen, and they move to the edges. There you go, Penn. They try to get away from that middle and make themselves more difficult targets. Peterson, now noticeably frustrated, turns his attention toward Horton. No! It's a fake, and he cripples Janssen's right ankle. This is down to Josh Horton. Okay. But Josh is really good. Oh. oh! Talk about an unforced error. Peterson will go down in history as the first dodge juggle thrower to go down. Oh, direct hit to Horton's gut, but Horton maintains control. Takes the ball right in the chest. We'll keep juggling. Horton dodges. Peterson scrambles to find his balls. Horton getting cocky and attempting a 360. Fails to make the simplest of catches and takes himself out in 51 seconds. Yeah. Show off. Here's the one takedown Peterson was responsible for, that blow to Johnson's ankle, and then two direct hits to Horton. Horton taking blows to the gut and then the chest. But in the end, Horton takes himself out with a failed attempt at a one-up 360, handing over a win to Peterson at 51 seconds. Probably the only way Peterson was going to get a win, but nevertheless, still a win. The second competitor in history to, one way or another, take down all five competitors. Up next, we have a unique matchup. Cameron Ritter, who's also an accomplished juggler, takes the position of the thrower. This will be particularly interesting and more threatening to the jugglers because only another juggler understands the timing that juggling requires and can strategize based on knowledge of that timing. The countdown begins and Ritter launches a couple of balls on either side of Max Poff and Poff's pattern goes poof. The ones in the middle always go out first. Yeah, that seems to be the problem. Stay out of the middle. And there's Josh Horton once again dancing around and staying out of trouble. Cameron Ritter of primetime personal training, the one in the one on five. Now going after Horton, missing the target. Ritter scrambles to find his balls, aiming in at Horton's face, but Horton dodges and stays in. Ooh, Josh. Yeah, he's jumping and moving and keeping the clubs in the air. Ritter now turns his attention to Janssen, taking him down and bouncing a club off Bronson's right quad. Ritter now going after Nicholas Bronson's head, Bronson's long neck allowing him to dodge without moving his body. Now he's in the middle, but takes the hit and keeps on chugging. Remember, Cameron has to stay behind that line, can't get any closer to fire the balls or to go retrieve Ooh, them. Nice try. Oh, nice Oh, right there at the end. Bronson, can he be the last man standing? Yes, he's going to be there at the end of the clock, and Cameron Ritter can only take out four of five. So here we see Horton dodging an onslaught of half a dozen or so attacks, able to keep his eyes on the incoming attacks while maintaining control over his clubs. 
We see Horton gets hit, but keeps going. And then right here, trying a neck wrap while under fire and loses control. Yeah, just spend your time taking everyone else out and Horton will drop trying tricks when he knows everyone's looking at him. But Ritter unable to take out Nicholas Bronson. All right, two more rounds to go in this historic event, continuing with Geisy. Oh, she, she, she tries both hands at once. Yeah, I don't know if that's, I don't well, know if that's wise, because you lose all the power. Well, that's the thing. The cannon fires twice, but only at half speed. Yeah. Well, Geisy trying the double throw has yet to take out a competitor in the first 15 seconds. Halstead, they're unaffected by the... We're not going to call them lobs. They're not quite lobs, but they're certainly not Jujimufus. Her best bet would be to wait until they get tired. You know, like well, another 20, 30 minutes. That's true, uh, and that would be a competition for another time. She only <laughs> has another 35 seconds here. And Johnson next on her hit list, causing a convulsion that results in a drop. They're getting a little cocky, aren't they? Geisy now dedicating two balls in Horton's direction, swatting one of them away, and another block with a club while continuing to juggle. Oh. Horton going back to his old ways, throwing tricks successful execution of a 360, there is no benefit to doing tricks in this competition. Ooh. Oh, Josh just inviting it now. And that's going to be time for Geisy who takes out two. Oh, she doesn't know the clock's over. Or does she? Just <laughs> taking out a little rage there at the end. Time is called and Geisy may think she was the one who needed to survive the minute, celebrating with a high five to the ref, then high fiving her opponent, something rarely seen on the field in any sport. Here again now are those walks by Horton. And now those moves while getting hit by the ball just continuing to show off. Horton doesn't just want to survive, he wants to survive in style. Monica now finishing off this year's Dodge Juggle one on five event. Looks like she's gonna go for that two handed approach. No, she has thought better of it after watching what Geisy went through. There's Josh Horton. Well, Josh Horton's just swatting him away. Josh just adding in some flair. He's the tough one. Monica does not have a lot behind those he throws. Caught, Josh, he caught the he ball, just goes into four, throws back, it back to I don't know. Back on the playground, that meant that Monica would have been out. Yeah. Liam Halstead swats one away. Monica is not having a successful round through the first 25 seconds, that's for sure. No, not at all. Horton now back to neck wraps, gets hit twice while paying more attention to his tricks, but doesn't lose control. Monica still looking to get a second competitor off the floor. Still four or five hanging in there. Ooh. Josh Horton's haunting Monica, as if to say, you have no chance of taking me down. She got a lot to accomplish in uh, five seconds, don't you think? I feel like the task might be too tall. Two, one, and thanks for playing Monica. <laughs> but Monica is still focused on taking out Horton. Oh, Monica, let it go, it's over. Oh, lands a blow right to Horton's face after time is called, after the whistle is blown. Oh, I, be I believe she might have just been ejected after the whistle. So here we see Horton's audacious flaunting of his abilities, instigating what inevitably resulted in a softball gently bouncing off his face. And one of Monica's shining moments when she successfully took down a nine-year-old trying to juggle. So this year, only two competitors successfully took down all five jugglers within one minute. And you can see here their international seating placement. Charles Peterson in second place with 51 seconds and the acrobolic Juji Mufu in first place with 28 seconds. That was one on five Dodge Juggle, which yes. is very similar to Chevrolet Juggle, but very similar. different sponsorship right. altogether. And thus begins the quest of all these unique competitors to dominate at the Moxie Games. We've seen Sniper Shorsh win game one of the semifinals against Beer Vampire, taking advantage of table corners and a temerarious disregard for head safety. Delaney Bayless maintained her lead in the WJF Advanced Overall Championship. Tom Rossman and Stefano Polinga tied at five points each with another five points to go. Eight highly skilled rock, paper, scissors competitors were reduced to four. Team White Dragons left Surreal Killers with a five point deficit and only seven more points to win the set. And the Moxie Games original event, Dodge Juggle, made its international debut. I'm Penn Gillette, and along with all the Moxie Games event organizers, hosts, and commentators, we thank you for watching. This has been a Moxie Games production, the worldwide leader in this type of stuff. Next time on the Moxie Games.
Beer Vampire attempts to tie the score against Sniper Shorsh as the Hedis Las Vegas Classic continues. The isolated combat juggling championship demonstrates what happens when you play combat but can't run away. Australia's Kenny Chong and America's Spencer Androli close in on Delaney Bayless's first place score with their five ball routines. Team Surreal Killers attempts to come back to jump ahead and win set one of the Sepak Takra Open. Rock, Paper, Scissors continues with the semifinals. Jorge versus JJ and Shane versus Bennett. Tom Rossman and Stefano Polinga battle to the 10 point finish line. And Dodge Juggle continues with isolated one on one. It's all about how controlled and contained they can contain, they can. Jason makes me nervous. Get out of here. We're, we are, ha. Ah. That was good with him doing it in the background, right? Kenny, keep juggling. It looks good. Oh, sorry. We're seeing a little bit of encouragement uh, or, or maybe heckling coming from the side. I'm, I'm not sure what they're saying. They're all speaking German. And first up in the five ball. Oh, by the way, program. Bill Gates never juggled. Steve Jobs never juggled. Uh, Malcolm Forbes never juggled. Uh, Pasteur never juggled. Jonas Salk never juggled. Hawking never juggled. So how do you rectify 25 years of juggling practice? Uh, I, I love doing it. I really do love juggling. I was talking about myself. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry no. And then I go ahead and do some squat thrusts, a lot of thrusts, <laughs> right. and then I go yeah. back to the biceps. Yeah, you're yeah, preaching yeah, to the exactly, choir, man. That's yeah. exactly how I do it. Yeah. It's, is, there any, is there a good out that you want us to uh, end on here? All right. The, uh, it edits to there. Beautiful.